I want to share with you a philosophy, which is that life is about asking questions and obtaining responses which lead to new questions. And to start with, I would like you to look at a graph, and I will not say anything for some seconds, because I want you to look at this. What this graph says is that we have a real problem. Nobody has found the, the answer to the question of what sustainable development is. Countries with high level of human development, as we measure it, have high footprints. Countries with low footprints have low levels of human development. That's the main question for the future of, not, of, not only of education, for the, the future of humanity itself. Not so much for the future of the planet, not so much for the future of life. They will survive without us for the future of humanity itself. Which leads me to another very, very simple question. A very intimate and absolutely universal question that so many millions of people are asking, so many millions of parents are asking. So this is about education, of course, but this is, goes much beyond education. And we have the paradox that in the countries which are, we still consider themselves as the center of the planetary system, this question is now asked more and more. Because people have the perception that the lives of their kids will be worse than their own. Many millions of people have that perception. Isn't that weird in the 21st century? So let me provoke you with some ideas. One is that it looks like we go at high speed, right? We go very fast. We have heard a lot about uh, the speed of technological innovation, the fourth industrial revolution coming, etc., etc. And it's true that there are many things which go very fast, but in some fundamental, really fundamental issues for the future of humanity, we are completely gridlocked, stuck in a place where we are not able to address the questions of climate change, loss of biodiversity, etc. Will technology solve it? Not by itself. Sometimes I've been 25 years an entrepreneur in the IT sector, and my conviction now is more than at the beginning that the framing of technological development is many times more aligned with the ideas that, the idea that humans, we humans have to serve technology. This is what I call the technolitarian scenario it's more aligned with that than with the idea that technology has to serve not only humanity, but life at large. And speed, you know, beware of that criterion. As some wisdom coming from a completely different lens brought to us, you know? So a good question is, what do we not see? I think this is a fundamental kind of questions we have to ask. Because we have so much information, so much knowledge, etc., etc., that we forget about our blind spots. And let me do a, a very simple experiment. If I draw this, this looks pretty natural, you know? If I start with the idea of us, myself, my family, my tribe, my country. Us is a very natural concept to us. If I continue drawing and I add this, this continues to look quite natural, right? We see that all the time. We use the concept of environment, us and the environment. But the bias is already here in this very simple scheme. We got it all wrong from that very beginning by saying there is us and there is the environment as separate things, as natural as that. So my friend, my dear friend, Mariana Borgesan is worried about the uses of AI in the future and if AI can be made beneficial and, 
And you are right in being worried about that because the biases are so well ingrained in our way of thinking that we take for granted that us and the environment are different things and that they are separate and then we can put processes in the environment to, to exploit it for our needs and then we also do this. We also put processes on other people. There is always a them. And of course, I mean, it's tricky to see how humans, we are so good at moving, drifting from the idea that I am different from you, distinction, to the idea of, well, I don't care so much about you, separation, to the idea of I'm better than you, exclusion. Exclusion which leads to exploitation. And this is so much ingrained in our culture, in our modern culture, that we don't see it. We don't even see that. We don't even see that there are many layers of between reality, our perceptions on reality, most of them being unconscious. We have built uh, the modern civilizations on the idea that we are able to capture the essence of reality through processes of conscious thinking, while most of the processes, most of the living processes are unconscious, including the billions of processes which keep us alive, you know. And then we skip the, I mean, this is not new. I'm not throwing here things which have not been elaborated by others, also by philosophers, sorry. And uh, that there is something between our conscious understanding and the perceptions which are frameworks of interpretation. So for instance, we have been taken for granted that we can separate reality from knowledge from action and actually we defined disciplines <clears throat> to talk about these three levels, you know. What is, and that we can separate them, that we can take a place which is from outside reality and we can acquire objective knowledge of reality and based on that knowledge we can elaborate and then we can elaborate separately what would be good or bad. And we defined roles for or mediators, uh, the role of science mediating between what we say is reality, what it is, and epistemology, what do we understand, and the roles of technology and law and institutions, etc., mediating between what should be and what we know, you know. And of course, the role of education trying to um, get us into the knowledge of these disciplines. But there are plenty of blind spots in the, in the, in the gaps between uh, reality, knowledge and action and in the fact that we are part, we are not outside of the environment. And AI, just to brief point on this, AI is not solving this. AI as it is today, maybe it can be reconceived in a different way. AI as it is today doesn't solve this, this issue, it just accelerates the issue. This is based also on the, on the idea, on the framework of mechanistic thinking. And the big, big paradox is that while physics has evolved over time since mechanistic thinking and, uh, and uh, the par that paradigm was developed in the 17th century until today, physics has developed many others, many other paradigms of science because that discipline has been able to realize, oh, uh, this paradigm of classical mechanics only explains a certain, a certain area of phenomena. And we have many more which are not explained for that, by that. Let's develop new paradigms. But we have not done that, or very marginally, as far as our social institutions are concerned, as far as our education is concerned, etc. And by the way, we forgot in the process, in the scheme I, I, I put before, we excluded areas of human experience which do not fit well in this rationalistic perspective of the world. And we put them, you know, into private spheres or in the sphere of entertainment. I'm talking about 
all kinds of spiritual traditions, all kinds of ancient knowledge, and for sure the role of art. Instead of understanding art as a different way to access reality, maybe a richer way because it involves a lot of our unconscious processes, we, we have converted art into yeah, a business, you know? Uh, Société du Spectacle, that's entertainment. All of that is very much related with this idea that effects have causes and that if we want something to happen, we have to define a purpose, a conscious purpose, then actions, and, and then we will get effects. But another, another good question is this one. What the dog will do? It comes from Gregory Bateson, who used this, the following metaphor to explain the difference between mechanistic thinking and living systems. If you kick a ball or a stone, you will be able to predict very precisely with the appropriate instruments of measure the trajectory of the ball. If you kick a dog, you cannot predict anything. She can run away, she can attack you, she can go around wondering why you attacked her. That's the domain of living systems. Living systems are not solutions to problems. Life has no problems. Uh, living systems are not answers to cause, effects, mechanisms. It's an infinite cycle of questions and responses with no end and no purpose other than life itself. And, and we have limited our consciousness, our conscious mind is limited to understand that. We can develop other ways to understand that, but a person who made a fundamental contribution to the history of, of science and knowledge, because he, he was probably the main character to reconcile thermodynamics with biology, said this, the word is richer than it is possible to express in any single language. So let's take care of that. Let's take care of the fact that we have to stop suffering from complexity and uncertainty. Yes, they are, they are here, of course. And, uh, and they are here to stay. And they were, they were always here. It's just our framing of uh, classical mechanics, if you want, of of rationalists who made us believe that the world is not complex. Fortunately, it is. And this leads me to my very last slide, which is again a question. If, if, if this describes some of the issues we have, a question for this conference is this one. What education for mutual learning? Because complex systems, living systems, don't change because we want them to change. They change by learning something else in a new con context. So what we have to do is basically to be involved in mutual learning. How education, formal or informal, can do that? I leave you with this question. Thank you.